Welcome to Franchise Empires, where aspiring entrepreneurs learn exactly what it takes to become a successful franchise owner from one location to 10 and beyond. I'm the Wolf of Franchises. Hey everyone, it's the Wolf. Today on the show, we have Antonio McBroom, the co-founder and CEO of Primo Partners. Primo Partners is the largest Ben & Jerry's franchisee in the country, and they're also a Starbucks licensee. Starbucks is about 95% or possibly more corporate owned, but they do on rare occasions hand out license agreements. And Antonio was able to be one of those lucky licensees and he's recently opened his first store. I think you're gonna really enjoy learning about Antonio's operation as well as his mission to help uplift black communities via his real estate and franchise locations. Hope you enjoy. The Wolf of Franchises is the CEO of Wolfpack Franchising, as well as a creator at Workweek Media. All opinions expressed by the Wolf and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Wolfpack Franchising or Workweek. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. The Wolf, Workweek and Wolfpack Franchising may maintain positions in the franchises discussed on this podcast. You're the largest Ben & Jerry's owner in the country, right? Yeah, my team Primo and I operate a total of 14 shops across the South. Largest and fastest growing Ben & Jerry's developers in the country. How uh, how long have you been in it? Like, uh, when, when did you buy your first location? So believe it or not, this week is my 15 year anniversary. On uh, wow. May, May 8, 2008, uh, I was about to graduate from college. And that's when I purchased my first Ben & Jerry's scoop shop in uh, Chapel Hill. I'd been working there a while in college and uh, yeah, just two days before graduation, ended up purchasing the shop. No way. Okay. Congrats. That's awesome. Uh, Thanks. Wait, did you go to, did you go to UNC Chapel Hill? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a Far Hill through and through. And uh, that's kind of how I got connected to Ben and Jerry's. I was at, I was there my freshman year for orientation and I saw this cool ice cream shop that had a now hiring sign up and I went in there and got an amazing milkshake. And I was like, this is the type of place I want to work at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. That's cool. Um, wow. All right. So did you, wait, did you say you purchased that spot that you, you worked at? Or did you just go out yeah. and get another Ben and Jerry's elsewhere? No, I, I purchased the one that I originally started at. Okay. What was the owner? Was he kind of on his way out and retiring or how'd you kind of make that happen? Well, just, I mean, it was a unique set of circumstances. So this was 2008, right? Where like great recession, major uncertain financial times. And yep. so I think from, from that, it actually created like a domino effect of opportunity where the person I'd been working for had the opportunity to relocate to New York and buy the Ben and Jerry's there at Rockefeller Center. And oh. that, that kind of created an opening for the store I was at that allowed me to, you know, um, be able to convince them that I was ready to take a step and, and buy the store. Okay. Okay. Noted. Um, wow. All right. So that's super cool. So you're, you're a fresh college graduate and you own, a, a franchise location. Um, what was there any transition, you know, challenges say from, I imagine you were probably like basically a manager right prior to that um, at that store, you know, but once you yeah. became the owner, was there any, any challenges with that new responsibility? You know, back then it was, it was just a lot of learning fast. Um, you know, I'd, I'd been doing all of my due diligence and, and homework on how to grow the business. And the biggest challenge for me was I had really ambitious, lofty goals to double the size of that business in a year. And, um, you know, my first approach around, you know, getting more people in the store, it took me halfway there. It, it, it increased sales by just over 40%. And I went to the extreme, man, like it's on a college campus. So I took it as far as saying, I'm gonna stay open to after the bars and clubs let out and see if I could sell ice cream, you know, in the middle of the night. And so we tried 4 a.m. and you know, over time, I learned kind of my sweet spot was like 1 a.m., right? Like, uh, you know, right right before the bars let out, because after that, I could spend a lot of time not serving ice cream, but cleaning up, throw up out of my bathroom. <laughs> so, but it was just kind of that that experiential trial and trial and error 
learning that, you know, but but those hours between 9 p.m. when the previous owner closed and 1 a.m. just on Thursday, Friday, Saturday night was a 26 percent spike in sales and transactions. So, yeah, um, we really focused on kind of uh, it was my first dose of dealing with municipalities and really focusing on the signage. How do I get this store more visible and get some outdoor seating? Um, and so that was a you know long process in that first year that I thought would be easy. I could just buy the furniture and put it out there. And then all of a sudden I started getting, you know, uh, ordinance violations and stuff like that and <laughs> quick. Quick, quickly learned that you had to, you know, follow these protocols with, with local municipalities. And so I'd say those were kind of the, the key learners in that first year. Okay. Yeah, no, for sure. Definitely some, uh, yeah, just um, that that kind of learning curve for, for a business owner on, on the technicalities, I suppose. Um, yep. I, and, and is that location that you still open till I've never seen a Ben and Jerry's open that late. So that's, that's cool to hear. Is it still open like at, around 1 a.m.? Uh, to this day, yeah, I I settled that one at midnight. Once I used to keep it open till one when I was in there uh, personally, and then as I started getting multiple units, I tried to get more systemized with my sure. approach, and uh, so I settled it at midnight. Okay, cool. And, and going from you know, I know there's probably a lot of things we could talk about between one location to the fourteen you have today, but you know. Uh, when I guess you know what's kind of been the the evolution of of your Ben and Jerry's portfolio, you know, did you uh, buy any of those in, in a in kind of a lump sum, or has it been one by one by one? You know, the it's been a it's been a fascinating progression. You know, it's been kind of this this cycle of every two to three years, you know, kind of major growth for for relative to where I am. And uh, and then recalibrating, growing into those sh- new shoes, and then growing again. Um, so you know, at first it was the one store, and the way I grew that store outside of driving more transactions, staying open later, bringing you know world class hospitality and guest experience, and wowing customers. The other way was through kind of omni channel, and this is before omni channel was a thing, but really, really taking the approach of how do I. Um, how do I have Ben and Jerry's as many places as possible in Chapel Hill? How do I get inside the, the football stadium? How do I, you know, cater all the student events? And um, and that was kind of, the, you know, boots on the ground entrepreneurial approach. And that and that really grew that that added a whole different revenue stream uh, to the business. And as I as I kind of formed a niche with that, um, you know, I looked for some synergy to kind of test how would it be to have you know, two locations open on the on, at the same time. So kind of get me out of this one store. And, and so the way I tested it first was by purchasing a trailer and a cart, you know, ice cream cart and ice cream trailer. And I started doing festivals and I, I got a place that uh-huh. let me set up every weekend. And it was kind of like I had a second store without having a second full store. And that yeah. helped me learn a little bit more about kind of process and, you know, how to how to start building a team. And so when the opportunity came to purchase, you know, my true second store, which was in Greensboro, um, I was ready. It was a it was a great um, segue in. And really, I'm a math major. Right. And I kind of created some mathematical magic with that purchase because I was able to take one plus one and make it equal three. And the the reason being was because I had the one store in Chapel Hill and I purchased the one store in Greensboro. But when I added up kind of the omni-channel off-site business from each market, it was actually busier than the stores. And so it's no kind of like I had this, I had created this new third true store department where I could now have, I could ha- have my first leadership team where instead of managing high school and college students only in kind of a seasonal capacity, I had a three-person full-time salaried management team one person for each department. And that allowed me to really get in my space of leadership development of market development and thinking about growth and scale in a, in a more robust way. Uh, And so that was really cool, man. I I enjoyed that for, you know, for uh, two or three years. And then we were kind of geared up for growth. Like we'd uh, you know, we'd um, you know, grew into that business. We were doing really well with it. And we created the capacity to do more, both the financial capacity as well as the people capacity. Um, and so, 
uh, at that juncture, we saw a great opportunity to expand further in North Carolina, in, in Raleigh and Durham, as well as into Atlanta, Georgia. And, uh, and so okay. that kind of created, that was that next growth cycle uh, where we went from, from uh, two stores to actually six pretty quickly. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and I, I love what you said about that uh, you had the, the cart slash trailer that you used at festivals and that was kind of a way of like dipping your toes in the water before jumping head first into a second location. Uh, yep. I think that that's, re that's a really good, uh, thing for, for folks to consider if they're at listening to this and at a single franchise location, if there is a way for them to kind of try that light, light model, if you will, uh, before going all in on a second location. Um, and yeah, regarding your, uh, I guess your catering business, it sounds like, uh, can you talk yeah. more about that? I know you said it was a lot of entrepreneurial, just boots on the ground, but um, you know, the fact that it was effectively doing the numbers of, of what a third store would have been doing, that's really impressive. So like, um, yeah, can you talk more about what, what is that you're catering for, for events and, you know, do you have companies that kind of provide it or like as a yeah. perk on certain days, you know, how does that yeah. work? Yeah. I mean, all of the above from, you know, festivals to large sporting events, to companies, uh, wanting to treat their teams to weddings and bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. Um, yeah. Just any kind of celebration with a lot of people. Okay. Um, and, you know, is that uh, something where now your employees are, are coming in earlier to, you know, make make the ice cream, get it prepped? And, I mean, even ice cream, you got to worry about it melting. You know, what kind of uh, – was there learning curves there? Because that's a, obviously just a yeah. different operation than – very, and then me very walking different. into your store and buying. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very different. I mean, taking basically, essentially, we're taking the Ben and Jerry Scoop Shop experience to a particular event. And, you know, I learned that it was kind of a whole different, almost, it was a whole different skill set or team member to be able to function in that kind of environment, that, you know, really dynamic environment. A store is static, right? It's like, you know, it can get very predictable these days. Um, you know, at these times it gets busy and here's how the weekends go and here's the time it opens and closes. You know it every single day. I mean, the, the special events business is kind of reactive reaction. You know, you got to when 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 there is an event and the weather's good, do you want to be there? And when someone calls, you want to be able to deliver. And so that created just a, you know, a, a whole different kind of side of my brain. I really appreciated it, you know, being able to figure that part of the business out, how to market that business and grow that part of the business. Uh, you know, for, for those first 10 years I was in business, that was kind of my, my number one goal was to be the top ice cream contractor, period. And if you got nice. a big event, you know who to call and it's me and my company and not just in, you know, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, but we started going all over the country. I mean, we would go to, you know, Grand Rapids, Michigan to, uh, you know, to do a, a, a large, a, lo a really large multiple week event. And we'd go all the way down to Gulf Shores, Alabama and do you know, to hang out music festival. I mean, oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't spare any miles. I love it. That's uh, no, it's awesome. Uh, that's cool to hear. Yeah, I've uh, I've actually been to that festival, so I'm familiar with that. Uh, <laughs> Fun <laughs> memories. A good time. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, well, I want to talk. So I know you got, uh, you know, you, you have a few, uh, I think, family members that are kind of helping you uh, with run the show here. Um, you know, uh, w when did you decide to turn it into kind of, you know, bring some other folks in? Um, and then even I'm curious about the name Primo, uh, partners that you, you know, your, your kind of corporate parent entity, let's say it, yeah, his name, yeah. you know, what's, what's the inspiration there? Yeah. I mean, Primo is a, is actually a double entendre for my company and in Spanish, the word Primo means cousins. And so me yep. and my original business partner, uh, Eric Taylor. He and our cousins. And so when we were forming this company and starting a business together, that 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 had meaning. And then also in, in black urban culture, primo means, you know, top shelf, creme de la creme. Um, and oh, so okay. when we when we when we thought about kind of what we wanted to represent in the business community and, and our first business being kind of buying a a Ben and Jerry's ice cream shop, which is the best ice cream in the world. Primo was the right 
brand and fit for us. And since then, as we continue to grow, I mean, we kind of tag a lot of our ventures, whether it's Ben and Jerry's or or real estate or other endeavors uh, with the Primo tag. Okay, cool. No, that makes yeah. sense. Uh, super, super cool. Um, and so that was you and Eric. Was that for the first location back in 2008 or was that uh, yeah. later on? You, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I found like as I started, so I'm the type of person, man, it just comes up with crazy ideas all day, right? I just come up with cra- crazy <laughs> ideas by yeah. the hour. Half of them are ridiculous and there's no way it'll work. And I always had, you know, a good friend in Eric who was a few years older than me and also a very just practical person, you know, where he's an engineer by trade and he's just very practical, realistic. And so I was talking to him one time when I was a senior in college, just getting ready uh, for, you know, for what I was going to do that year. And I was like, man, call me crazy, but I think I can buy this ice cream store that I'm working at. And he was like, you are crazy. (laughs) <laughs> but this is an idea that that, you know, if you're going to see it through, I'd love to be a partner with you. On. And so um, it actually worked out well because, you know, being a 20 year old trying to buy a business, a franchise, you know, there are requirements that's just like out of reach, man. I mean, you know, you've got certain net worth requirements, certain liquidity requirements, um, certain experience requirements, credit score. I mean, you you name it. And from a standalone standpoint, I mean, I was I was barely even halfway there and but when i looked at kind of how me and eric complemented each other as a team you know and yep. i looked at the fact that he was four years out of school and so he'd already been in corporate america and he'd been able to establish credit and um you know from a debt to income ratio standpoint you know he had substantial income and from my standpoint i didn't have any debt because i was on scholarship right and so you put these things together and all of a sudden like we're right there at qualifying for being able to purchase this this franchise, and so, um, so you know, he and I have been day one partners in the venture, and uh, it's just been phenomenal. And you know, in those early days, I didn't understand how we made the magic we do. You know, I didn't have the words for it. I just knew that, like, typically, whenever he and I kind of tag together on a project, it comes out really good, and. You know, over time, we've kind of learned that we've got a really complementary skill set where, you know, I'm a um, kind of hands on operational, uh, you know, marketing, sales, uh, relationship generation, idea generation. That's a world that I live in all day um, and can do really good at that. I'm not a details person at all. And so when it comes <laughs> things like, you know, it comes to things like, um insurance and taxes and stuff that really matters you know eric is on top of stuff like that and he always has yeah. been even before he joined the business kind of in a hands-on capacity just as a partner he always uh you know just made sure that we were really protected and our stuff was was together and so over time we started to really embrace that that complementary skill set now we lean on it you know we 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 tag up and, and we really kind of work in our core strengths areas as much as possible yeah, no, I think that's uh, there's a great lesson in there for people. But you know, a, a good business partner uh, should ideally right balance balance you out and uh, kind of co- cover your weak spots, uh, or even just not necessarily weak spots, but sometimes just the things yeah. that you really don't like doing and getting involved with. Um, which I, I'm kind of with you, man. I, yeah, the details of stuff. Uh, I like to work on strategy and the fun stuff. Um, yeah. Yep. The, <laughs> All the paperwork uh, kills me. But um, anyway, uh, well, I want to talk about, because there's something incredibly, I think, unique, too, in what you're doing, um, you know, I mean, beyond all, all the work in, in, in trying to, to bring your businesses to inspire and, and, and uplift the African-American community. But you've also, I know, you have a partnership of sorts with Starbucks, which that doesn't happen too often. Uh yeah. Can you tell yeah. us, you know, like they don't hand out. So I guess for listeners who aren't aware, Starbucks is largely, largely like, you know, it's called 95% possibly, probably more corporate owned stores, but they do license certain locations. So it's not technically a franchise. Uh, it's a license agreement. There's similarities to, to the franchising aspect, but uh, regardless, Antonio here. Uh, is a licensee uh, of Starbucks. So yeah, how, how did this? Uh, I guess when did that? When did your first Starbucks open, and and how did that all come come to happen? 
Yeah. So, I mean, this is a, a really new part of our journey in terms of being a, a, a licensed operator of Starbucks. We actually opened our first Starbucks in February of this year. And we're really happy just to, you know, diversify our portfolio and to, to really yeah. gain this <clears throat> this level of a brand partner. I mean, but, you know, my, my fascination with Starbucks goes back a long time. They have for a long time been uh, a company that I've kind of driven my business uh, operations toward. I mean, Starbucks, when I think Starbucks, I think of hospitality and I think of consistency, you know, and for for years, I just I just uh, really pushed my team to come up with processes so that we could deliver the same type of consistency as Starbucks. And then, you know, as we as we grew as a true developer and curator for um for for particularly black leadership development um, and running a a black owned uh, kind of black led majority people of color organization really successfully with Ben and Jerry's, um, there was a degree of kind of magnetism that happened with Starbucks and us where um, you know um, following the the tragic murder of George Floyd, uh, tons of companies just had a, a, a heightened awareness around. Uh, race relations in America. And Starbucks is a company that I'll give credit to having always had a pulse and a heart for social justice. And I think at that time, they really wanted to elevate the company's impact in communities of color and um, and embarked on what's called the Community Store Initiative, where they were building 100 Starbucks across the U.S. and kind of in, in uh, you know, different locations that are closer to uh uh, diverse communities and and built with an intention around diversity more so than ever. And yeah, so I talked with them about that endeavor and kind of consulted with them as they were doing that because that's kind of part of what I've done uh, in my business with Ben and Jerry's all these years. And as we were kind of getting to know each other and and doing that, um, I think we just really saw some more promise to you know work even closer together. And that's where I. You know, I just asked a crazy question. I ask these crazy questions all the time. But just like, hey, <laughs> what, would it, what would it take for me to, to operate one of these shops? Um, I know you don't really franchise and stuff, but what would it take? And so that's where we started exploring different ways with my, you know, with my background and credentials that I could become a partner. And, uh, and so I'm really excited about this new journey as a, as a Starbucks licensed developer uh, in the Southeast and, um, yeah, I think it's a great compliment to what we've been building with Primo. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Uh, I mean, how, how did you even first did you is there like was there an application page to even apply? Because I got to imagine even getting in touch with someone at a company of Starbucks size. Is, is it easy? Yeah, no, it's not easy. Um, no, it's just like I said, I, I, I live by the mantra, the, the quality, your quality of life is directly tied to the quality of questions that you ask. And, you know, the just because a question seems far out doesn't mean it's not high quality. And so when I was when I was when I got connected with the Starbucks kind of social impact team and we're talking about the community store initiative, um, you know, it was just a, it was just a question. And from that question okay. led led to different conversations. Yeah, no, sure. Um, that's I mean, that's amazing. Um, and are you able to kind of bring some of that mission uh, approach, right? Where re you're really trying to get involved with the community and uh, and inspire more uh, minority-owned businesses. You know, are you kind of able to do anything special with the stores? Or if I walked in, would it look like uh, your standard Starbucks? You know, they're, they're, I, I try to kind of do that magical blend of, you know, consistency and brand standards with authenticity to my culture. And so if you go into one of my businesses, typically there's going to be uh, some custom artwork. And that artwork is is, is certainly um, centered toward race and equity. So with, with our Starbucks projects, uh, project, for example, um, you know, as we were in the design process, we actually were intentional about hiring a local um, South Carolina uh, black artists and muralists to do a great mural inside the store and feature uh, some history of the university. Uh, 
uh, a lady by the name of Henry Monteith who actually integrated the university. Uh, I'd, I'd read about her and um, was actually connected with her son and asked could I feature her as kind of the, the centerpiece and tell her story about integration uh, at the University of South Carolina as part of our business design. And she was honored and agreed to it. And so when you go in our store, you see that and it just kind of creates, you know, uh, it creates a kind of homage to history, but also, you know, conversations and thought provoking. And I've tended to do that in a lot of my, a lot of my establishments in my Ben and Jerry's in Greensboro. You know, I've got a mural of the sit-in movement uh, that started in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, the Greensboro Four. Um, and it says, you know, they, they uh, took a seat so we can take a stand um and um i also in houston in houston uh, the exterior of my building I, I did a really cool mural that uh has you know folks from all walks of life uh eating ice cream and it's it spells houston h-u-e-s-t-o-n so kind of houston the different hues of colors all uh, eating ice cream yeah, yeah. so that's been a way that i've been able to kind of bring the individuality and creativity to you know kind of standard store footprint and design I love it. Uh, it's awesome that you're able to do that and integrate that in, in, into these kind of national or international, even well-known brands. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, with Starbucks, how, how many, uh, are it, what, what's the overarching goal there? Is, is there a certain set amount that you're going to be able to build or is it kind of as much as, as much as you can handle? Yeah. I mean, at this point it's still, still kind of early learning stages, you sure. know, and I've always, I've always kind of, known in business to keep your main thing the main thing um and at this point as i as i'm, I'm just learning more about the brand and how to operate stores at a high level um but it de definitely open for growth i mean one of my pillars one of primo's pillars is growth we that's that's what we're built on growth servant leadership and hospitality and so you know uh we're certainly not a uh you know build one shop and and settle kind of organization at the same time i don't you know i don't i don't see us opening 100 next year so it's just a it's, it's kind of progr <laughs> yeah. progression progressive journey of learning and then uh you know as as we as we get more comfortable with the business we're excited to continue to curate and put together a really special collection of starbucks stores yeah okay now i i like it i think uh long term i feel like you're going to still have a ton of success with that more deliberate approach um and Thanks, w without uh without being intrusive you know i don't want to know uh i'm sure you have you know there's there's contracts and whatnot where you can't necessarily say the specifics but but generally uh you know is that license agreement is, is it similar to a franchise agreement where percentage of revenue is going back to corporate but you guys are footing the build out and uh you know is that kind of how it works or is there anything kind of different about it compared to a franchise yeah, I mean, I think I think my my learning from from franchising and licensing is, is a, a lot of times it's uh really similar partnership dynamics, and it's just you know what what paper do you use to formalize the partnership? Noted. Okay. Awesome. All right, Antonio, this has been a super fun conversation. Uh, you know, if anyone listening wants to uh, follow you or Primo Partners and any of your franchise locations, are there uh, any good spots online that they can do that? Certainly, uh, you can you can follow us just by visiting our website, PrimoPartners. Uh, dot com, um, and you know that's where you'll see some of the latest uh, stuff and content we've created, uh, some of the latest projects that we're working on, and uh, just updates from me and the team. Cool. All right. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll plug that in the show notes, everyone, so you can check it out. Uh, Antonio, thanks again, man. Uh, and uh, hopefully we talk soon. Wolf, this was a blast. I appreciate you. Thanks for listening to Franchise Empires. We're coming to you soon with actionable insights to take the next step on your franchise journey. So make sure to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen.